Hello there, and welcome back to the Disconnected. I am here with Todd Strauss Scholson, somebody that I know primarily for my love of the film The Final Girls. We're going to be talking about this, some of the other works that he has been involved in, and then a shared passion for physical media and perhaps the, the future in that. Todd, thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. Uh, the, the big thing I want to say is, uh, thank you to my friend, Jeremy, that set this up between us. He is a wonderful human being and I I've adored and been, uh, preaching the love for final girls since it came out. This is, uh, w- that, that year that it came out, it was one of my favorite horrors that came out. And I, I feel like it was just such a unique idea for a movie and came out just wonderfully. I, I'm, I'm so glad that you had a, a big part in that. Yeah, I directed it. I had a big part. I, <laughs> it is wild to me that that movie, I still have to talk about, I still get to talk about that movie all these years later. It was a small movie. It was a labor of love. All of us that made it still are our friends. It was a magical, we burned real bright while we were making that movie. And and it came out and it was a bummer the way that it was released. And um, it broke all our hearts and it was a couple years too early, you know, was yeah. just if it was on Netflix, it would have been a different kind of story. But but it, it became what it's about, which is a cult movie. And <laughs> I, met, I met him and two weeks ago at, at, at like a Halloween screening in Los Angeles. And that it was amazing that screening even existed and it was filled with fans. It's just it's just crazy. So I feel lucky. It's lucky that it became that. Well, one of the biggest parts of it is it, I, to me, it's one of the best modern examples of balancing horror and comedy, and not just in the the stereotypical, we're going to say that horror and comedy is, you know, difficult to balance properly. It It's actually balanced properly. There's fun jump scares. There's actual good comedy. It's not something that you have to you fight to say, hey, if you like comedy, you might like this. It's not really your thing, maybe. It's like that perfect melding of genres. I I really love how it came together like that. Thank you. I don't know how we did that. It wasn't that hard. It seemed pretty easy. It was hard to get the money. It was hard to get it off the ground. It was hard to shoot it with no money and no time. But that tone came pretty naturally. And we were all I was and Josh uh, Miller, who wrote it, we were all very passionate about telling a personal story about loss and grief. It's, I, I tell the story all the time, but I had lost my father, you know, a year or two right before I made this movie. Josh had lost his father, who was famous actor who played Father Karras in The uh, Exorcist. And Josh's only way to, re- to experience his dad after his de- death was to watch The Exorcist and watch his dad get murdered over and over. That was the way <laughs> that he could see his dad and say, hey, in this gruesome, grisly sort of twisted way. And I had lost my father before my first movie, which was a Harold and Kumar Christmas, which is a ridiculous movie to have made first. (laughs) And when I was editing that movie, Josh and Mark, um, who were friends and and, uh, a couple and partners, writing partners, sent me a draft of the script. And I thought, I know exactly what to do about this because it felt like it was my experience. It was movie about having a second chance or one more chance to see a parent that you love to maybe save them to have one last day and to to yeah. protect them to save them from you know death and then the meta part of it that was so fun and pleasant villi and back to the future and purple rose at cairo we just felt like such a fun game to play but i think we were all very focused on the last like 25 minutes like that like that was the movie we went around pitching it like friday the 13th meets um terms of endearment which was like the worst <laughs> fucking pitch but that was that is how we were thinking about it initially it was less like we're like we're gonna do a horror comedy parody meta take it wasn't that was all too cerebral we were coming at it with our hearts and the rest of it sort of fell into place somehow i uh i've never told my wife this and uh any, anybody please don't share this with her but one of the things since i saw this movie and i've been doing this sort of thing with uh youtube and podcasting and all that other stuff is this movie kind of uh led me to think about the way that i interact with this for my kids differently because one of the things that i'm gonna have you know a possible legacy for them is if if i drop dead tomorrow because i'm, I'm a i'm a fat ass uh <laughs> they can go back and say man i i can watch him be passionate about films for 
500 hours if I want, because that's what he talks about all the time. <laughs> that's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, and, so and Bible you, girls and spot made you think about that. Yeah. Th th that's one of the, the original things that I I've watched this movie probably eight or 10 times and uh, watching through after I started all this, it was, man, it, there, there is these, this actual creative side that my kids will get to be able to touch because it's YouTube. I mean, it's possible that it could all be deleted, I guess, but in, in some forms, this will be there in perpetuity. I, I mean, I've got all the videos and my kids can watch that if I were to drop dead tomorrow. That was really beautiful. I, I hope you don't. <laughs> Me too. You're not the only one. How, how big are you underneath this screen? Are you that big? Well, for, no, I, I'm not. I, I carry it well, but I'm, I'm six foot five. I, I'm a okay. giant human being. Yeah, so. you're a giant human being. <laughs> you're a of a buffalo. Yeah. Yes, I, I basically am a buffalo. Uh, one of the things that I've always thought about with f directing films like this You've got comedy, you've got horror, and we've talked to death about the the way that the genres are pretty similar. Now, when you're doing something like this that has an emotional core, and you're dealing with somebody like Adam Devine <laughs> and Thomas Middleditch, and people that are known for improving just hilariously, how, how do you wrangle some of that in? Was, was it a fight making this to, to get some of that improv to calm down? No, not trying to get it to calm down. Uh, there was... <laughs> I tried to see the tone in the casting. That was always, everyone was always, we were trying to get the money. What's the tone? What's the tone? Because just reading it on the page, it did feel like three movies. It felt like it was his mother-daughter thing. It felt right. like it was like a horror movie. And then it had this sort of meta comedy quality and no one could quite tell what the tone was. And I didn't quite know how to describe it either because it just seemed so natural to me. The tone was like my personality, I guess. Yeah. Sort of Self-aware, but pretty you know emotional and sensitive person and funny and I, and so that the the casting was the tone as in it was going to have some people who you are very funny that you know and they can do that it was going to have you know a pretty grounded anchor in Taisa whose performance is not a comedy performance it's right it's almost a dramatic performance it's she's I watch the movie now on when it's screened and I'm like Jesus she's so cellophane thin she's so fragile she's almost whispering yeah. her dialogue you know like you can feel this and Malin, who was able to kind of do a combination of funny but in real life she had just become a mother do you know and so i think that that feeling of of love and of brightness and of just caring so much about some other things so suddenly that was i think very close to the surface and and then there was like nina and alexander who were sort of um They'd come out of like, you know, like CW, sort of almost like soaps, you know, like a, yeah. kind of a melodrama, like a modern melodrama. It's like, yeah, there's that too. There is a melodrama to the movie in a nice way. And we thought it would be that. And then the comedy stuff, I'd come from a comedy background. I'd made Harold and Kumar. A lot of the short films I'd made are all comedy things. And I was around comedians all the time. And, and comedy troops in college and all that. And so I knew how to do that. And the script... One of the things that I, Mark and Josh wrote the script, but I got involved early and then we did like a year and a half of just like fucking with the script as we were trying to find wow. out. One of the things that I tried to bring to it was was a lot of the meta stuff, the fun game of that, how the movie would be an antagonist. Like that was, you know, that was a clever thing to do, I thought. Clever. And, and the comedy. And I had a bunch of friends. They were alt jokes. We had pages of alts for every line. And so there was that going on. The script got punched up by a million hilarious people that were just doing me a favor. And and so the script got funnier and it was punchier. And there were these sheets of extra jokes. And Adam and Thomas were just friends and, and Alia too. And to see them just, you just knew. You're like, yeah, you just, you were like, okay, so... <laughs> This is a scene where you're the biggest fan of this movie and you don't know that you're in a movie and just start talking. <laughs> and that just felt like a very fun, almost improv game for them. Always you run into trouble when you have one person who's great at improv and one person who's not, but they're trying to keep up. Yeah. That's trouble because the person who's, for no fault of their own, it's a very specific and hard thing to be that nimble um, and hilarious. But sometimes you get into a situation where the person who's not quite as strong at it tries to keep up and it starts to interrupt and tries to talk over. And then you kind of are just like, it's, you can't really say it, but what you want to say is just don't, 
try. Let them just do it. <laughs> Um, but with Thomas and Alia and Adam, they're all so great. You don't have to say that. You just get to sort of sit back and watch the movie unfold. And maybe they'll right. stumble into something and you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Michael Jackson thing. Do that. <laughs> do that a couple more times and react to it like this and react to it like that. And then you try to – it's very exciting to watch them do it. It's like they're performing the movie just for you and then you get to actually kind of mold it as they go. Of course. So that was great. The, the individual characters in this are just so unique and it really highlights something that I feel about this that I think a lot of movies just don't have the ability to capture. And that's, uh, I, I've used this term before, but I kind of describe this as a bit of a chameleon film because there are some movies that you really have to be in that perfect mood to grasp the 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 extent of the emotions or or something like that it, some of these you could catch on the wrong night and it just doesn't work for you with this because it has the different tones the different types of stories there's kind of somebody in here for every single person to relate to it feels like do you feel like there's there's anybody that's been left out when when they're responding to this is there any like group that hasn't responded well to this that you're questioning how <laughs> I would say that a lot of people don't know this movie exists, but if you've seen it, <laughs> you love it. And that is a pretty, that just feels cool in a way. That's kind of like the kind of the movie that you, you'd like to have one of those in your career. Exactly. You know, like um, maybe it wasn't successful, but it was influential and it's people really love it and they love to, it's like a badge of honor. You know, if you know this and I, when I was a kid, even still, I sometimes I'll see something. I'm like, no one's ever heard of this. And now I'm the only one that is privy to this like secret, yeah. beautiful jewel. And I get to share it with people and you feel so excited that you get to tell. And I get the sense that maybe somehow this became a version of that, but I don't know why that is. I think the movie is warm and funny and we did have fun doing it. And I think that you can maybe maybe feel the energy that we had in the making of it maybe is somehow infused into the movie. So it it is a little euphoric and giddy and it's filled with – it's dense. When I watch it yeah. now, I'm like watching a different version of me as a filmmaker do it. And I'm still – I'm like, damn, this movie is full of ideas <laughs> and – um, it's dense and it moves, it moves fast, it moves like a yeah. rocket and it's true. It, you never, it never gets too static. You're always getting propelled forward and it's either a joke or you're surprised by the heart or it's some stylish visual thing or it's a scare. I was worried. We all were worried that horror fans would reject it because it's PG 13, right? A little soft. It's a little soft on its in its horror. It's not gruesome. It's not, you know, really a slasher because right. it is, you know, but and we were so surprised when it came out that it was the horror community that that loved it, that were the early adopters and that were the most vocal fans. I'm forever indebted. And I'm part of that world just as like a person who loves horror movies and grew up watching them and wanting to make them. But we were nervous that we didn't have a choice. We had to do it at this rating or not do it at all. And so we mm. made that compromise and tried to be clever and about how we did it. But it was amazing that the horror community they didn't need the they didn't need the blood and gore. They right. just wanted some scares and a love letter and an homage and and they and I hear so often I get emails and DMs and all this of like I lost a parent and it means the world to me, you know. From from people that like are covered in tattoos and have septum oh, yeah. things and are just look like you know that they're horror the horror community. Yep. But you know, horror movies are not for sociopaths. They're for sensitive, um, smart um, people. The the horror community itself is a community first, and I feel like this is a community movie. There there's so much that uh, just watching this, <laughs> I, I don't know if this is too like sappy to say it. It can feel like a support group type of film yeah, because yeah, you yeah. you get this emotional resonance when all of us have faced tragedies, and this is if you could go back, this this is you reliving some of those things that you you would just dream of doing, and it's an incredible feeling. 
I think that the, I mean, just to talk about horror movies, like, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that that, I think there's probably something true about that. Certainly I hear that enough that I'm like, I guess so. And that's <laughs> great. But, you know, like all of the most perennial horror movies, the Fridays and the nightmares and the burning and all those, all that stuff there, they, they are, they're like gross and all this and, but they're sort of good natured. They're sort of innocent. Yep. You know what I mean? Like the the perennial ones are, they cost nothing and they look like shit. And you go to the conventions and you meet everybody. And yeah. there's something good natured. They're not like, it's not like watching funny games, you know, or like <laughs> a movie that is, or like um, what what was it? What's that Lars von Trier movie with Matt Dillon, like Jack the Builder or something? <laughs> the house like, that Jack built. <laughs> the house that Jack built. Like those movies are that those movies are for crazy people. Like those are <laughs> those are not not good natured movies. And there's a obviously a place for those. But yeah, the heart community. I think we love these these fucking movies because they smile very clearly about intergenerational grief and yeah. And you're like, yeah, it's just like sci-fi. You're able to sort of do subterfuge of human stories of loss and all that and grief and um just primordial feelings and you can you can work them out with a group so i think support group is like the perfect way to contextualize what this world is and i love being part of it uh i don't want to hit this movie like into the ground by asking so many questions over so i think i'll go with one more thing on it and that's to bring it up in context of Modern horror, because I feel like a lot has changed uh, since the cusp of perhaps streaming is is the reason for it. But we're getting a lot of we're getting a lot of films that are about trauma, and not that this isn't because it obviously is. But a lot of the more modern, like straight to streaming horrors, will straight tell you this is because your mother died, and we need to dive it's something like that. And something about Final Girls is it is so obviously like that's the front of the story but it somehow doesn't feel like it's hitting you over the head with that messaging. Uh, do you feel like you had a big part to play in that nuance or does it feel that way to you? Do you feel like it's different from modern horror in any way in that trauma sense? I don't, all I know is that all I know is that I, and I know that Josh too were the movie that we thought we were making we knew, I knew it was like, yeah, the action, the jokes and the meta, and that's all so fun, but it wasn't primary. It really was that our big hearts were right there on our sleeves. And, um, my father was right there over my shoulders really soon after. And it was a movie about that and, and full, full of love and, and that scene at the end, which is the whole movie is building towards. I mean, like everything is a strategy as in, you know, the movie is funny so that it's disarming. So it disarms you so that in the end, when you, when they say goodbye and she goes, I'm a movie star, you're, you are not expecting to cry, but you're gonna, because you've been charmed by the movie, you've been tenderized by yeah. it. And, James L. Brooks movies do that. A lot of movies that I love, you know, Cameron Crowe movies, you know, Jeremy, they do that. They they incorporate humor as a, as a storytelling strategy to get you engaged, attuned, in love with those people, and 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 not like combative with the movie. You know, like you just kind of are surrendered to the movie, and then at the end we can get you there. And the horror and, and the pace and all those things are strategies to make that last scene work. And when we shot that last scene, the goodbye scene, I can just tell you that I was sitting in that church in Baton Rouge in the middle of the night. I had eaten five hamburgers and it was me saying <laughs> goodbye to my dad. That's what it was. And through their, through their mouths and I was watching the monitors and I was crying and I felt him right there behind me. And that is a real feeling that was in the room and those actors felt it coming off of me. When the crew would ask me questions, they would speak quietly because they could see that I was going through something. 
And I think it was contagious. It was purposefully. I let people see that part of me because I wanted it to be infused into everybody. And so I think that for all of us, it was all building to that. And so it wasn't so intellectual about this is trauma and this is the psychoanalytic reason why. But it was really just a big heart. Um, This is a big heart in when we were writing it and when we were making it. And that, I think, maybe is the feeling that's in there. That last act is very, very vulnerable. And clearly that vulnerability was coming from, from somebody who was feeling vulnerable. So yeah, it, it comes across. Yeah. And Thaisa's performance does it. And Malin, again, yeah. she was, was talking to her daughter and she just had one. So I think there was some lucky break cosmically that like I was obviously living it, but so were they. Yeah. You know? And so whatever that, whatever that, Whatever that um, confluence of events or that like clot of luck, um, <laughs> maybe that's what you're feeling. I don't know. Well, I mean, it, it's got to help having an incredible cast like that. And uh, being being a fanboy that I am of one individual in particular, and not to make you uh, fanboy yourself on somebody else, what is it like to work with Bo Burnham, who, in my opinion, is like the most modern renaissance man that we possibly have and i i say this knowing full well that he uh i i've been watching him i think i found his very first youtube video within about a month of him posting it and i followed him every single step of the way and even w- with zach stone not being this huge piece that it was i really think that this is going to be looked back on in a decade as how have you not seen this because this is a, a brilliant show ha, you know kind of is that I, I don't think that I realized it at the time either. Like inside, I thought was like the most incredible, probably the best piece of COVID art that got made during that year and a half. I I I loved it. I loved it. He's obviously some sort of a genius. (laughs) Yes. But I think at the time when I did that show, I didn't know. I didn't know that he was a genius. He was so young. Yeah sort of green and it was his first real thing after just doing videos but outside he, of his attic literally <laughs> yeah and he was really young i was older than him and but i was young too it was one of my first jobs um and what do i remember from it i remember he knew what he wanted but it was a challenge for me actually because because that the conceit of that show was that it was like a you know a faux documentary but that yeah. i couldn't do any of the things that i love to do which is like you know this s- s- stylish cinematic language right. i mean final girls is that's what i like to do and this was i felt like quite restrained but they wanted me to try to figure out how to bring some of that stuff into this format and so that was i was just like i don't really know what to do but he was great and he's a genius. And I also can't believe that I got a chance to, and for a couple <laughs> of weeks we were together doing that in Los Angeles. Um, yeah, it was just a really exciting, cool thing, but I don't think, I don't, I hadn't even made Final Girls. I don't think that he knew, I, he didn't know me and I didn't really know him. <laughs> so right. we kind of did it, sort of did our That's job. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah I, I really hope that that eventually finds some sort of audience because, man, that his it, every single thing he touches, it seems like, is just waiting to find an audience. And the moment it does, it explodes. You could tell that he knew exactly what he wanted to do there. And I think that because he was so young, he was leaning on a lot of other people to help him bring it to life. And then I think you'll you find that he's like, I'm just going to bring it to life myself because now I know yeah. how to do this. And <laughs> <laughs> but he's he and he's the best person to bring that stuff to life because it's his and it's incredible i mean like eighth grade is like the greatest it's a first movie it's unbelievable so yeah he's just genius eighth grade blew my mind when it first came out and primarily because uh i, I don't know i mean you and i are, are fairly close in age but something about it like I was on the cusp of being the age that was witnessing the rise of social media right after I came out of school and it was still a part of everybody's life, but then not being in touch with that, but being just older, it it felt like this alien nation watching (laughs) this movie. (laughs) I remember just being like that. The, I remember 
there being vividly like a scene or like she's like watching people talking at a table. She's like trying to find the moment that she could yep. get into the conversation, but there just isn't one. And you're trying to herky jerky. Can I is now the time. And as an adult man, I feel like that constantly. And I think that putting it in the body of a little kid, a little girl, but any little kid. Yeah. I, mean, I, think, I don't think he was making a kid's movie, obviously. I think he was trying to make like the first, like an adolescent movie, like the first time that you feel all the feelings that you still carry into adulthood. And I found it very relatable and clever in that way. And really sweet and emotional, even though it's a bit yeah. sarcastic and ironic, you know. Yeah, a little bit cringe on purpose. Yeah. Um, I, I imagine you felt that moment quite a few times uh, and maybe some pressure when your first film is part of a franchise and, and you're stepping in. Nice kinda, transition. Look at you. Segue. Doing my best. Uh, is there pressure with that? You know, when you come in, you've got Neil Patrick Harris and, and these other big names that have been uh, building their chemistry. Now you got to come in and make your chemistry with these people. How, how does that feel being that your first movie? Um. I had wanted to make movies my whole life from when I was like single digits. And all I did from when I was 13 until I was in college was make a movie every day after school. So this is just to say that this was a dream come true to get to make a movie. And prior to that movie, I'd only made short films, nothing more than 10 minutes long. Wow. So this was really something. But I was also like um, a lunatic. I was like Wiley e. Coyote. I was like, <laughs> wouldn't stop. I made movies every day. One year I made like 250 little short things. Wow. You know? I mean, and I was editing them and shooting them. I, I was a nut. And so by the time I got to that movie, I did feel pretty confident. Um, I felt really confident because I felt that I had just put in the hours and I, and I had felt confident in my ideas and my technique and th that I could do jokes and I was ready. Um, I just felt really ready. Doing a movie that has a number three at the end of it for your first movie was probably <laughs> not my dream as a child. But I also did feel like, I don't know, man, like what did James Cameron make first? Like Piranha? <laughs> yeah, Piranha 2. <laughs> yeah, I was like, well, okay. I guess you could do it. Like Jonathan Demi made targets. So I was like, you could, okay, it's a way to do it. And it was a really big budget. And it was in 3D. And I loved those movies. I mean, yeah. I used to, when I was in high school, I was like stoned watching the first. Who doesn't? Movie. Yeah, I loved that movie, and I thought that it would be a great showcase for me, also because it was it was episodic kind of in nature. You know, like you could do multiple genres inside of one movie. You'd have the chase yep. scene and the heist scene and the musical number, and you could do all this. And it was a warm story about friendship. And the Christmas part also, I was like, God, there's just so much cinematic stuff that I can play around with. This is so, and, yes. I, and I was like, wow, I can't say no, I want to do it. I also remember thinking that doing the third in a franchise, I felt this competitive thing in me, like almost mm. like sports, where I was like, I'm going to show them how to make a Harold and Kumar movie. Because I remember the first one was great and the second one was just okay. And I felt like I'm going to fucking go. I'm going to show them how to make these like us. I remember thinking this is going to be a spectacle. I'm going to go full spectacle with this, like a William Castle movie, you know, <laughs> 3D and all. I was watching all those William Castle movies and I was like, yeah, I'm going to just like full out every trick, all that. And so I kind of came into it with that spirit. But I had a thousand blind spots. I also was like two months out of losing a parent so i was my nervous system was shot and i didn't realize it and i was 28 or 29 something like that wow. so I was pretty young to do that i was the youngest person on set by far including the actors so that was and the crew was like 150 it was a big movie it's like 150 people were in detroit i was far from home the whole thing was overwhelming and i'd never done anything like that before but i was confident but I had all these blind spots we had a dp who was not nice to me he was not collaborative he it was just really really challenging and the 3d of it made it so that we, we were stuck with him so that was a daily challenge to navigate i'd never worked i'd never been in a creative situation where people didn't want to just be supportive and collaborative right. or weren't my friends and suddenly i had a you know a kind of a arrogant person i was like i don't know what to do with this 
And I had also never been in a situation where like things were cumbersome, you know, like if you had to block a scene, I had never blocked a scene. I didn't know how to do that. And the actors would say, we kind of want to go here and here and there and there. And I'd go like, looks good to me. And then I'd look at the DP and he'd be like, well, that's going to be like 35 setups and that's going to take us all day. You've got to get them to sit in a chair and have this conversation. And I said, oh, okay. Can you guys sit in the chair and do it instead? And then they'd say, no. <laughs> and I wouldn't know what to do. And so there were just a lot of blind spots like that. I had a, there was a hazing. It was kind of a hazing process in a yeah. way. And, um, but it was ultimately a great experience. That movie is nuts <laughs> and also filled with energy. Um, and, and it got, it was made me really prepared to do final girls. I mean, I did sort of want to make my first movie second is what it felt like. It almost felt like they came out of sequence in a way, but I learned so much editing. That movie was wonderful. There were a lot of amazing people that I got to work with. All those actors were great. John and Hayden who wrote it were incredibly supportive and they just passed that torch over to me and they were just incredibly instructive and supportive and great. And the studio was great too. They gave me my third movie. So it was a hazing and there were blind spots, but it was ultimately an insane first thing to make at quite a high level. Yeah. It also, I mean, it, it probably served you well going from the high energy of 250 shorts a year to the high energy, very frenetic type of filmmaking that comes with a quick studio film with some of the most frenetic actors and, and a, a franchise out there. Yeah, like I feel like that I was like thriving when it was like that heist scene or the music. Yeah. I was like, yep, or the car crash. I was like, can't wait to do this. But I also was just like, the stamina it takes to shoot for 45 days, I didn't know. There is just like some bread and butter things you're like uh i don't know <laughs> that's like a lot of my brain has got to be that focused for that many days in right. a row without a break i just never done it before so you kind of got to know how to pace yourself and i've gotten obviously better at it but at the time i think i was just full just going full on adrenaline and that's not a bad thing either I think that quite a few people that will watch this are individuals that have uh, likely shared similar dreams. They've, they've wanted to be creative. They've wanted to make something and you've done it so many times. And even just with the shorts, a lot of people don't find that drive. So when you're making 250 a year, how do you stay motivated? How, how do you feel like you're, you're even shooting for that next level when perhaps 250 is uh, a lot to keep up? We'll say, well, I don't feel that way anymore, but at the time, I just had this dream. I don't know. I probably was on the run from being insecure. Like I had to, mm. I had to constantly prove to myself that I was good. Otherwise, I would forget that I was, and that was probably a driver. And sometimes I just wouldn't make something for a second, and I would feel awful about myself. And I'd make myself make something, and then I'd watch it and be like, "Nah, I'm pretty good." And <laughs> and and. But I also like was very had this goal of doing this. And so I don't know. I, I don't know. I, there, it, I, I would say many other parts of my life were underdeveloped, but I put all my energy into this. Um, and um, that year with the 250, that was just nuts. I don't know how that happened. I, that wasn't just like making 250 personal shorts. You know, I made a couple, but that was like jobs, you know, right. like college humor was a thing and branded content for candy bars. And you got I need 10 of these and we're going to do 30 of those. And while you're at it, do two of these. And I so I just kind of got this momentum going, but I got it in my muscle memory. And and then I was also making my own stuff, but it was a lot of that. Those one off do 30 seconds, two minute thing, man on the street. Right. It was like that stuff. But at the end of the year, I counted it up and I was like, Jesus fucking Christ, how can I do this with my eyes closed? That was, right. that was at the point where I was like shooting stuff in order so that when I would put it into Premiere, I wouldn't have to like organize anything. <laughs> like my brain turned into the edit. I was like, okay, this is like, now I can just do this so easily. I don't know if I could do it like that anymore, but certainly in the lead up to that first movie, that's how I felt. 
I, I think one of the best things that anybody that's trying to do anything creative can really start to grasp is that different people are motivated different ways. And for, you know, individuals that either were feeling insecure based on certain things, or maybe the opposite end of the spectrum, uh, some people need that motivation of somebody else coming in and saying, no, you, you need a little more work. And I, I'm glad that you were able to hold yourself to that with, with those 250 items. How was the feedback in that time? Do you feel like in that year you gained enough momentum that that's truly what got you to where you were? I think there, well, just to talk about what you just said, I think that one thing that happened, my dad was like the Royal Tannenbaums. Like every day after school, when I was in high school, I'd make something. Wow. I'd like in-camera edit some little dumb movie. They were usually chase scenes or some Sam Raimi-esque something or other. And... And when my parents came home from work, I'd show them my movie. And they did not always say, isn't that great, honey? Wow. They'd be like, this one didn't make any sense. Yesterday's was better. Or this was boring. Or like, I don't get it. What is happening? So, you know, that was helpful. But also, it was brutal. Yeah. I, you know, but it was, but it kind of just kept you hungry in some sort of a way. It was a mixed bag. And then I, for my own reasons, I had this crazy engine in me. And, but I never had a mentor and I went to a high school with no arts programs and in college I sort of did it alone. I got involved with comedy troops that suddenly were like actors and writers and I got to make their stuff and that was exciting. But kind of the thing that was leading up to the movie was I remember it really vividly because for like nine or 10 years I was broke and losing faith. And I remember on New Year's Eve, I'd be like, how much longer can I actually do this? Like, this is awful. Every, I just, how much longer can I put myself through this? This is right. terrible. And I'm like, one more year, I guess. And, but I, I'd gotten weird, odd jobs and all this stuff. And I was making things a lot, but not the kind of things I wanted. And I remember there was a moment where I remember, I think someone told me this, but like, you can't control what anyone else likes. You can only control how good you are. And it made me, that was very helpful because it made me feel a sense that I could control something because I felt like I had no control over anything. I was writing music video treatments or I was just trying to get anyone to hire me or sign me or get mm -hmm. a manager and I had no control over it. And someone was like, forget about the outside. Just focus on getting so good that you're undeniable. I found that to be incredibly helpful advice. And then I just started to watch a thousand movies. You know, I always watch the features and all that, but I started to like really dive into movies I'd never heard of or never seen. I'd pick a director and go through the whole thing in order. And I started to make a ton of short films alone and try to give myself filmmaking challenges. You know, maybe wow. I take a subject that sounds disgusting and make it romantic. Can I create... Can I create mood? How can I, can I do mood? I was watching all these Cronenberg movies. I was like, God, the atmosphere is so, <laughs> what is this feeling? Like, can yeah. I create a feeling like that? Challenges, things I hadn't done that I want. And so, and I, at the same time, I was doing these dumb jobs. And I remember there was a point where I was, I'd been, I got good. I was doing all these jobs. I could edit and shoot and do it fast and do it cheap. And but I hated what I was actually making. And I remember I had all this anger in me. And I, with that anger, I was like, fuck you. I'm stealing the camera. I'm stealing the tracks. I'm breaking into the office. And I'm going to shoot something this weekend for myself with my friends. And, and I'm going to fucking, and like, the feeling was like, fuck you. I'm going to show you what I've got. Because I hate that I'm being diverted into this stuff. Wow. Instead. And we shot this dumb little short and I cut it together all the same way and we put it on the internet and it went super viral. And I got, and that one was the one that suddenly I had agents and representation and it was my way, it was my way in. And then I kept on doing those shorts and it was, I kept on doing that for a year and a half. And those are the shorts that New Line saw and were like into and that got them to give me Harold and Kumar. Damn.
And all those shirts are on my website. <laughs> <laughs> Which will be linked in the description below, of course. <laughs> I mean, with with that, when you're holding yourself to this insanely, like, uh, almost, like, anal bar of I, I have to be incredible, what was your bar? What were you aiming for? What, what were those films that you went, a damn, if I can only be as good as this? I mean, I can tell you the movies I had a, my whole personality was movies and my ceiling in high school was covered wallpaper to movie posters. And those movies were Magnolia and Boogie Nights and Armageddon and Fargo. And I mean, these filmmakers, you know, and I, I had an Army of Darkness poster and I had a Die Hard with a Vengeance poster because I love John McTiernan movies. And I love Jonathan Demi movies. And what else was up there? I, maybe uh, I loved Michael Bay movies. I loved those. I loved that the game was on my ceiling. I mm-hmm. thought that was the greatest. So I was very compelled by filmmakers that had a very um, specific visual style. Basquiat was on my ceiling. Wow. In Chernobyl. I think any filmmaker, I was like, whoa, I've never what is what are those images or what are those camera moves or what is this feeling and what is yeah um music choices holy shit and die hard with a vengeance is like the best new york movie ever made i loved woody allen movies r.i.p when i was a kid though i loved them and so those those i just any filmmaker that had a really specific visual language even like link ladder and the before movies and slacker and stuff which is not such a crazy visual language, but there's a feeling in those movies that is mm-hmm. spoke to me. And so those, and um, Back to the Future 2 and um, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, you know. Masterpiece. But I, but I also, I was, but also I loved, you know, but I was watching everything. I was watching all these crazy Ken Loach movies. I was yeah. Every, I tried to watch every movie in the video store in a row. That was what I thought I would do in high school. But I would say that those those were the filmmakers that I was I was just trying to be someone that had a language. Um, yeah, that and and Goodfellas was up up, up there in Casino, obviously. Of course. <laughs> I mean, there. I mean, you know, if you're this age, you, it's kind of the same movies. Yeah. There were like deeper cuts that I loved, obviously, but that's what made the ceiling. Well, and it seems yeah, like I loved Oliver Stone when I was thirteen. <laughs> nice. Uh, it seems like through what uh, Jeremy passed on that you guys had already just briefly discussed that you're still kind of beefing up a lot of that film knowledge. So we'll we'll dive into some more of the physical media stuff in a minute. But before we do, I got to ask, what is Silent Retreat? If you can share much on it. Well, Silent Retreat's a heartbreaker for me. Uh, I don't know if that movie was going to, I don't know. I don't know how that movie gets released. I don't know how that happens. I, I, I don't, I don't know, man. What is that movie? After Isn't It Romantic, I had written something small and very strange with my best friend about four dummies who go on a silent meditation retreat and it turns into a silent comedy. And I myself had been on many um, meditation retreats and thought it was a psychotic thing to do, a beautiful thing to do. I'm, I'm a meditator and it's a big part of my life. But also, it's a very silly thing. Everyone's walking around like a zombie, slow, crazy. <laughs> and I thought, gosh, that'd be so funny to do like a Charlie Chaplin movie at a silent retreat. What a clever idea. And so we wrote a script pretty fast. And I got a guy to give me money, like $5 million, to kind of go do whatever I wanted to do. And we it was very hard to get famous people in the movie because it was so small so but we got a great cast isabella rossellini and we shot it and no one no one bothered us but also no one helped us you know mm. it was almost kind of like a fake movie we were just sort of like off there doing it all of my agents did not think this was a good idea for me to do this but all of my artist friends were like someone's going to give you a bag of money to make something what sort of definitely do it right I did it and it was an experiment it's a crazy tone it is a drama but it's also a slapstick comedy and i thought that would just work and maybe it does i don't know anyways covid crashed into our world mm. and suddenly film festivals accepted 
no movies and 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 distribution and I don't know what happened, but it is a movie without a home. And I don't know how to get it into the world and I don't own it. And so it's uh, uh, not a great feeling, <laughs> but it's definitely, you know, I just think like when I'm 14 and I'm in the video store and I watch some movie that's like just so strange, like Earth Girls are easy. You're like, what else was so bizarre? I don't even know anymore. But you're just or like some John Waters early. We're like, you're just right. like, I don't even know what this is, but there's value in this. This is just someone that went hard at something. And what a yeah. weird thing. And that's kind of what we thought this would be like an experimental comedy that was good natured and strange. And can we do that tone? Like, can that tone hold together? Like literally slipping on banana peels <laughs> and also straight up like Buddhist Dharma. Can that work? And I don't know, but it's some weird, secret, shadowy movie that I hope one day finds a home. I hope so too. I uh, just looking through some of what I, I felt like what the influences were for some of these movies, especially Final Girls. I, I feel like the moment that I opened Silent Retreat on IMDb and I saw Isabella Rossellini attached, I went, "Man, that is a fucking win." That that is a director that looks at this and goes. I got the person that I wanted in a movie, and this is incredible. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I sincerely hope we get that out there for you. You know, it's a crazy one. You, ever, you know that movie Crime Wave? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I remember Crime Wave. I was like, well, this isn't very good, but God, this is so interesting. Like, what? A, we're like brain donors. <laughs> I used yeah. to love brain donors. Like, well, this is the craziest thing. So that uh, we tried to do that. <laughs> One of these movies, I don't know, who knows? I, I don't know what, I don't know, I don't know. Well, uh, it, it sounds like a not great situation for you, so I hope it somehow works itself out. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. But uh, funny enough, you just brought up one um, to, to transition good with. Brain Donors is getting a release on physical media on Blu-ray for the first time ever, uh, literally in like two months from now. With and special uh, it's, features? Uh, I think there's a new audio commentary on it. I'll, uh -huh. I'll check while we're talking. Um, <laughs> it is uh, one that we've been waiting and talking about since it kind of got soft announced uh, a while back and it, it got delayed and delayed for the announcement for quite some time, but it is finally coming. And uh, yeah, new audio commentary by the director. Wait, uh, really? Yep. New audio commentary by Dennis Dugan, moderated by Lee Gambin, who is a film critic and a uh, film historian from Australia. And he's amazing. Oh, holy shit. I'm going to buy that the second that I get off of this. That's what I <laughs> yeah. Think movies <laughs> kino lorber yeah they, they're they're doing amazing stuff out there and it sounds like you yourself love some physical media so so tell me what what do you love about physical media i mean i i sort of mentioned it briefly but it is a true story that i grew up in queens i grew up in an apartment building and in the right next door to the apartment building was a video store west coast video and i truly i think maybe i was how old 12 or 13 or 14, something like that. I was the man. My, I was like, my business is going to be, I'm going to watch every movie in this fucking store. And I'm going to start from left and go all the way right. And I don't care what the movies are. <laughs> I don't care if I've seen them. I don't care if it's kids or fairy tales or sci fi or any. I don't, I'm going to watch every single one of them. I want to be an expert. And that was my plan. And that's what I did. And then every couple of months, they would like change how the store was um, set up. <laughs> And it would fuck my whole shit up. <laughs> so that I was like, could you please stop doing this? I'm here every day. You need to do this. And you can imagine a 15 year old in there. I said, stop. Yeah. <laughs> I'm your number one guy. And sometimes I'd go to the store and I could sit on, you know, like milk crates and watch movies there. Yeah. And they loved movies. And so it was, just, it was just, I loved it. But I also loved learning about, movies from the filmmakers commentary obviously i loved learning how movies were made so the featurettes where you could sort of see behind the scenes stuff were just dazzling you know i just yeah. wanted to know everything the camera oh the camera's on a dolly that was a crane i just thought it was just so cool and also i something i mean i still do it on criterions people thought that i was insane but i found it i'd always watch the features first and the movie second if i'd never seen it 
It's dangerous. <laughs> well, I almost was like, I don't give a really a fuck about like criterions, especially. I'm like, I probably it's not a good way to do it. But I always was like, <laughs> I remember being in film school, and sometimes you would learn about the movie, its context, why it's important, its history, what came before, what came after, who this filmmaker was, how they got to this moment yeah. in their thing. And then you'd watch the movie and you'd 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 watch it knowing what you were watching or why it was necessary. I remember the red shoes. I like wanted to know all about Powell and Pressburger. And this is like at the tip top of their. Th and it, it was so hell and that that dream sequence has been ripped off a thousand times. And so knowing <laughs> that stuff and then watching the movie, you're. I don't, I don't know. You're you're. It's like watching a football game when you don't know who's playing, and then suddenly when you know all the backstory of every player, you're like it's so much more engaging to watch. And that, and so I always would do it like that. I wanted to do the features first and the movie second, so I could watch it with a more developed eye. Um, and so that is why I love physical media, and particularly learned so much from commentaries and audio tracks and. You know, you know, I mean, probably everyone that listens to this knows doing those commentaries, a lot of filmmakers were pretty shitty at those commentaries, long periods of no talking or <laughs> doing just like color commentary. And you're like, yes, yeah. in this scene, watch what I do. <laughs> or you're like, oh, I remember she was so happy this day. You're like, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> like, give me information. Teach me. Educate right. me. Tell me how. What were you thinking? And, you know, got, obviously, Paul Thomas Anderson and Oliver Stone, there are a number of people who who maybe grew up on laser discs or and just knew or just were born and bred teachers who would be incredible with these commentary tracks and they would name check movies and I ripped that off from this thing and on this day that and my prep was this and you would really get a crash course in how it was made. Yeah. And... And then you would, then I would go and write down every movie that was mentioned, and then go watch those movies. And that would be the way that I built a web of knowledge. And I thought it was always such a gift when filmmakers were did not play it cool when they were very um, open with their influences and technique. Yeah. I, when I was a kid, I thought maybe the first thing I would do is be a makeup effects artist that I loved horror movies and I thought gosh Tom Savini and Rick Baker and I could do that I'd love to do that and that's what I did at home after school my movies then were like latex and chopping nice. up an eyeball and I was old and then I had a pump you know a blood pump in my uh, wound and, <laughs> and I would buy liquid latex and I wrote away to Dick Smith you know who that of he course was, they got and I and he was alive and we had a correspondence he was very easy to access and he wrote back and and it was and we for maybe a year maybe there was four or five back and forths i remember the funniest wow. one was like, i ruined my mom's um bathroom with liquid latex do you have any advice on how to fix that <laughs> and he wrote back and and but i remember that in his responses they were full of information it was passing knowledge forward. I, and that's why well, there are so many, all of the next generation of makeup effects people love him and learned from him. And it wasn't about like siloing away your secret recipe, that it was about giving it freely. And that's yes. your legacy. And I always, I think about that. I try to do it. I learned everything from that. I literally uh, just got done editing a feature from somebody that learned under Dick Smith that uh, did makeup in uh, the late nineties and just listening to the way that that was passed down. It, it's so, I mean, first of all, it was inspiring obviously for a lot of these people, but it was just, it wasn't just puff words. They were actual like, no, go do this and you will yeah. be able to do this. It was like instructions. It was actionable stuff. I mean, that's, yeah. Even going to Q and A's, I mean, see Q and A's and stuff. Sometimes they just are not saying anything that's helpful. Right? <laughs> Why are you acting like you don't want to be up there? Like, tell me things that are actionable, you know, that are clear and specific, and just talk. One, I remember seeing um, William Friedkin. Also, Peter Bogdanovich was this way. 
in these Q and A's and like one per, I mean, they're obviously sociopaths, but there'd be like one audience question and then they would talk for 90 minutes <laughs> and you'd be like, great. That's all I want to hear is just stories and insight and influence and how do you, and how you did it. But I on Harold and Kumar, the guys, the effects team was Nicotero and Berger. And I couldn't fucking believe that I got to hang out with Greg Nicotero. Yeah. And all we want, all I did is talk about Dick Smith. I told these stories. I asked him a thousand questions about a thousand movies and how'd you do this? And oh my God. And, and again, the generosity of sharing that knowledge. Yeah. It's just being a teacher. It's just the best. And, um, Anyways, that's why I love physical media because it just felt so fucking generous when these yeah. DVDs would be stacked full of stuff because who's that really for? It's for people that want to learn how to do it or like just love it. And so it just felt like Halloween every fucking time you got one of these stacked up discs that would just teach. I have enjoyed so many that are just film school in a box. So what are your many favorite times. ones? What are your favorite? Oh God, there, there's so many countless ones. Uh, are you staying up to date on much other than Criterion? I, I know you love Criterion right now, but is there uh, so there's some import ones that are the visual essays that are coming out that are contextualizing the people behind these. Uh, so like there's a label out of uh, Australia called Imprint Films, and they did uh, like there was a a film with Nastasia Kinski who daughter of somebody that was deplorable by all accounts and just explaining the adversities that this individual had to go through and why she would make this film at this time and how you can almost see the pain on her face and yet she pushed through that and gave this performance it brought like so much more power to that performance and it's her it's an interview with her or it's a it's a it, literally it's a, a in the, it's a in film the, scholar just doing a spoken word essay about Nastasia Kinski. And it's just incredible to hear all of that. And it's that's one of those things that, like, uh, what you were saying, I'll watch the features and then I'll appreciate the film when I watch it. There are so many of these that the features, they're teaching you something about the film. And people, yeah. a lot of times, they just don't understand that. So, like, there was a an Asian film called Detention from a few years ago that was based on a video game. But it was based on a real historical a period of atrocity where people were literally murdered. Like it was a, a period of genocide. And because we're ignorant Americans, I knew nothing about it. So I watched the movie and I was like, well, this is neat. The effects were pretty cool. It was a decent story. And then I watched the features and I went, holy shit, hold on. What? And then went for a week and researched the hell out of this whole subject because the extras were so intriguing to me. And that alone, like, I, I was inspired to go study like at, at in the, my mid thirties, like what kind of, a that's, that's a gift that, that we're can be inspired like that. I'm, I obviously agree. I'm just looking through my list of things that I've watched recently and just trying to think of what are good ones to talk about. I, I mean, there's the repo men box is stacked, filled with incredible stuff also because yep. of the era but um but um uh what's what's his um oh my god what's his crate what's his fucking name harry dean stanton there are some interviews with harry dean stanton that are unbelievable have you you know what i'm talking about this one? Oh yeah so fun where, where someone asked him a question and he's like smoking cigarettes is so old he's all made of leather and he goes what the fuck are you asking me for like i have an answer for that ask the universe like he's so yeah. <laughs> abrasive you're like this is fascinating there's an amazing i just watched um they all laughed do you know that bogdanovich movie there's I some have not seen it yeah well you can't stream it i mean that's obviously you must talk about it all the time physical media because it's yeah. things you get until you can't find half of these deep cuts man they all laughed is um an unsung bogdanovich it's from the early 80s john ritter is in it and oh, wow. and and it's in shot in new york and the DVD has got a commentary by him and a, a very hilarious featurette where young Wes Anderson, maybe two movies in, is interviewing Peter Bogdanovich in a coffee shop. And there's a lot of things that are nuts about it. One thing that's nuts about it, it's a half an hour long. One thing that's nuts about it is that whoever the crew was that was hired to shoot this interview clearly knew that they were in the presence of two geniuses. 
And so they're trying to be really fancy with how they shoot it. There's like moving, there's like moving over shots. And you're like, well, how many cameras did you guys have? Did you guys have twice? Like how, what is, how is this? Wow, there's like mirror. You're like, this is quite um, fancy. Right. Also, the movie's like pretty bad and like doesn't make any sense. And Wes Anderson goes, you know, I have a real fondness for this movie, Peter, but it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and he goes, <laughs> yeah, you know, that's kind of the point. It's my favorite movie I've ever made. And you're like, this is your favorite movie you've ever made? He's like, I really felt that I hit a second chapter in my career. I really felt like that I had wow. it. And then you watch that movie and you're like, this movie makes no fucking, s it doesn't make any sense. Even not like for the first hour, like until the end, you're like, what was any of this? <laughs> but I thought that the featurette being an interviewer, one of them is like, this movie makes no sense. <laughs> my, uh, my big Bogdanovich uh, find recently, I just saw targets for the first time. And oh, yeah. That, I mean, Criterion just put that out and discovering that in the period of hell that we've had over the last decade with uh, mass shootings and all that, 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 that was a wake up call. I loved that movie. I love that movie. I mean, I, yeah, I love that movie. I mean, I saw What's Up Doc projected recently, like an, a year and a half wow. ago, after he did his, one of his last Q&As. Unbelievable, still. Incredible. Incredible. You ever see... Um, local hero you know that movie uh i think so it's it's been a long time it's very fuzzy it's on the criterion channel i don't know there is physical media i watched it streaming but i think that there is little bonusy things from the time mm. it is a very it is one of those movies it's an amazing movie it's a sweet movie it's a crazy it's almost like joe versus the volcano in terms of like it's a fairy tale but it's not and but and it's but it's not and it's like a billionaire that Burt Lancaster, an old Burt Lancaster plays. It's like from the 80s. Sends a young guy to a town, I think an Irish fishing village, to get everyone in the town to agree to like sign a thing that lets them like build a factory in their port or something. something. But then he falls in love with the, with the town. This sounds like a movie you've seen like a thousand times. And yeah. yet, there's a magic to it. No one's that famous in it. No one that made it really went on to do anything else. The tone, the music, the town, the cast, the way the story is told, it is one of the most charming. There's magic in this movie to the point where Criterion sort of put it out. And that's one where it's not really a physical media story, but that's one where you're like, what is this little pocket of film history? And right. how did this happen? <laughs> That a bunch of people that really didn't have like these, you know, wildly successful careers, they struck gold. They made something absolute. They made a jewel. It's hard to make a jewel. They made a jewel. Well, lots of these discoveries happen on physical media. So I, I got to ask, you know, somebody that was a, a video store kid, how, how did that first time feel? Like, how, how was your mind blown walking into a video store, being able to see a film that you directed sitting on that shelf? Oh, yeah, that was good. <laughs> 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 I love the tone change there. <laughs> Do I remember what the first time was? Uh, well, I think there are already no more video stores. Uh, but like, like walking into a Best Buy and seeing it there, that was good. Um, uh, yeah, that was good. <laughs> <laughs> I was in a, a good one was I was in Taos. New Mexico and Taos has a video store like a fu fully functional not like ironic like a just an actual video store that people come and rent videos at DVD yep. and they have all the newest movies and all the newest TV shows and I was like I went in because I there's just the thing of browsing for of course. movies was the best I did it with my family. I would do it in relationships, you know, like in college and out of college and just hour. I remember having meltdowns and being like, can we just pick something? Like that thing of like sitting in front of an Apple TV and like, what are we going to watch was like actually at a store <laughs> with like a lot of people. What are we going to watch? But this was a video store in Taos. And I was like, what? How are you in business? Like, how are you actually like here doing this? Right. And they were like, well, the mountains make um, the Wi-Fi really bad here. 
So actually, people can't stream. They have to watch DVDs. And I was like, this rocks. <laughs> and I went all around the store. And it was so cool because all my movies were there. Wow. And a bunch of friends' movies were there. And I was like, this is so fucking rad. Because that was sort of the feeling that you're talking about. It was like walking into a first-run video store. And suddenly, like, your stuff is there. And then... You, you know a lot of people whose stuff is there now in the first run. And I was like, God, what a crazy, it's great. Obviously, it's like a um, bucket list kind of a feeling. Yeah. You know, as as you were kind of raised in that video store thing, so were a lot of other filmmakers. And not just not just in like finding films and discovering them, but like you just said, the the finding the special features, that's kind of like the second generation of video store items where Criterion came in and made these popular. How do you think now that it's, this is just a depressing thing to bring up, but you know, most of our modern filmmakers that are brand new, a lot of them don't own physical media at all, or, you know, are discovering through streaming. How do you feel like that's going to affect some of these filmmakers? I don't think it really matters. I feel like I think, well, there's YouTube so that you can get like so much more information so easily. So I don't know if like that part of it is lost. Like, yeah. like the process by which you get the information is different as it is with like every other thing in modern life. Sure. When I was like formative in that age, it was like you'd hear about a movie and you'd go to the store and they didn't have it. And you have to go to the city and, try to go to a tower records or a kim's video and see if they had it and if they didn't they could order it and so it was like a treasure hunt to get to this thing that was so important and then you would devour it so you don't really have that in the same way but i think you still have access to that sort of information and probably a lot more of it and letterboxd is great and there's so much more community and you could also make things and have an audience for them. Like, not like TikTok and that, and that shit, but like, <laughs> I just can't imagine what it would be like to be in high school and be making, be wanting to be a filmmaker and be making short films and not just be making them in my room for my parents, but to be making them and putting them up every day and then having yeah. real, real time, time feedback with people and maybe fans and, you know, and, I think I would have loved it. So I like with everything with technology, it's a double-edged sword, like the joy of the hunt right. and the specialness of this treasure, probably not the same, but I still think that you can stumble on things you had never heard of and all these pockets of crazy film history and cult movies. And yep. this leads to that. And I still think that there's, you could do all those tributaries. You just get it easier. I don't know if that's the worst. My yeah, I, I'm fine with that part, and I agree with that. My big thing is the what's the best way to say this? Like algorithm versus curation. Yeah, because yeah. a lot of what uh, people like us have been shown were because somebody could say, "Me and my ancestors weeded out the terrible shit." Here is the things you need, and now you got TikTok. You got you know if you go on YouTube and you watch the wrong video, the next 38 yeah. that you're recommended are going to send you down some weird rabbit hole. hundred percent. And I think a hundred percent a video store was great because it was democratized and it's very hard when you put, when you open up any of those platforms, you really got to know that you're hunting for something and that it's just different, but you know, yeah. I, I'll make the other argument also is that like, if you have a little bit of knowledge and you're like, well, I love, I mean, I don't know what filmmaker. I I love targets, and you go pull up targets, and it's like other movies like this, or like there's yeah. the filmmaker, and you can immediately dive into that, you know, and like it's just a different way. But I will say, I'm in New York now, and one of the greatest things about being here is these, um, like the film form, like these move, like these theaters that program the program those corners that you maybe don't know about they're not just yeah. like LA is so dumb <laughs> <laughs> not all, not everywhere they're american cinematic no it is for the most part <laughs> and like places do great curating 
But there are but most of these places are just like alien. You're like, I but I've what about I need to see alien? Like it's cool, big screen alien. Right. Here it's like what what did I just see? Victims of sin. You're like, what the fuck is victims of sin? It's like some the Mexican the me, the me, the heyday of Mexican cinema was in the fifties. All these crazy black and white film noirs, gorgeous. This one's a musical. The music is Cuban. Never heard of it. Wouldn't wow. even ever know to look for it. And they're programming it. And you go, oh, let's give it a shot. Let's <laughs> give it a shot. And you go in and you watch it. At home, if you somehow stumble on or are told of some movie and you go, let's give it a shot, at least for me, and I must not be the only one, those movies are not moving at a clip. You know, they're old right. movies. The long movies or slow movies is just a different wavelength. It's just challenging at home because you dominate the event. Oh, yeah. You have a remote, you have a phone, you're distracted, you can stop it, you can get up, you can talk. It's different. And when you try to experience, you know, slow cinema, older movies, strange movies in a theater, it's a much better experience because you, I mean, at least I'm paying attention. I'm really can see what I'm looking at. Killers of the Flower Moon is a new one, long in a theater, amazing. At home, yep. I did the impossible. I just watched Farewell My Concubine, 35, up on the wow. big screen. That's a tough, that's a violent, fucked up, <laughs> weird melodrama, gorgeous to look at. In a theater, it is mesmerizing. It just carries you away. At home, it just wouldn't be the same. So, even more than physical media, I feel like being like one of those like um, archaeologists, you know, or whatever, like just having that thing in you that like is a collector, like that collector's feeling of like, I want to know yeah. all of these corners of the history of all these weirdos that made these things. And I want to be an autodidact about, and I want to remix these ideas and try to steal things from deep cuts. And it's such a more fun way to do it in a theater. I think even more than being at home on DVD sometimes. Fully agreed. I, uh, I, I just fear for the people that are in uh, Mississippi or Omaha, Nebraska or something that, that don't have these opportunities. And it, it well, you're hurts. in Kansas. Look at, so what is it? So tell me you people that listen, people in your community, people that are young that want to do it. Do you feel like that they can't find the information or that they do? And it's so much more transitory. I think the people that want to see it are, they know the ways to find it. The hard part is gaining new fans. You're a victim of, you know, sh shitty Facebook marketing or, uh, you know, it's a small theater, so they can't pay to market things appropriately. So you're not hearing about rep screenings. Hell, I, uh, a label that I'm friends with just, uh, sent me an email say, Hey, you're in Kansas city. Uh, just, for, I don't know if you know about this. And they told me about a label playing one of the, or a theater playing one of their films tonight. I had no idea. They, they don't get to advertise like that. So something like that, it's unless you're seeking it out, it's damn near impossible. And a lot of those times, uh, the ones that are showing it are remote in a way that's intimidating. So right. if I want to go to uh, a nice rep screening where it's shown appropriately with a nice environment and not some shitty AMC that's falling apart, I'm 45 minutes to to somewhere decent which it's not bad but then you put in i have a full-time job and two young kids and blah 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 and suddenly it's a five-hour trip and a babysitter it's making more money than me <laughs> but is there any but is there anything about if you're on letterboxd or you're just like in a community or you're in the know or you've got some friends that like love movies and word spreads it's always been a word spreads kind of a word yep world you know like blood simple was a word spreads kind of oh, yeah. movie, even back in the day. like south park like all those things were like little viruses and the, even then so if you're in the know and you hear about something you can just kind of quickly get it on a streaming service or just you're not supposed to but you know you can just fucking torrent it like and you can get it right that's why i do what i do i spread the word about as much as i possibly can that's that's the big thing it's one of the, I mean, it's one of the great things, it's one of the great things about being a filmmaker is that when you get to hang out with other filmmakers, sometimes if you're lucky, unless you're talking about box office, all this bullshit, but if you find some people that really love movies and want to talk yeah. movies, like how people talk sports, it's like if you want to just talk movies 
And I love doing that. I don't know jack shit about sports. Did you see me trying to like sort of like <laughs> tread water talking about football a second ago? <laughs> oh, believe I live in Kansas City, the home of the freaking Chiefs and the Royals. I can't stand sports. So everybody here is just players. Uh, right. They're on fire for them. And I'm like, I don't fucking care. <laughs> but if you want to talk movies, like everyone is sort of like trade trying to almost like be like, have you seen this? Have you seen that? Yep. And you just sort of Someone just liquid sky. What's liquid sky? What's liquid sky? It's some crazy sci-fi art movie from the eighties shot in Greenwich village. What the fuck is liquid sky? Can't get it anywhere. Can't even buy it. Gotta rip it. Crazy movie. Um, uh, Chud. I just watched Chud. <laughs> Speaking of New York movies. I know. It's like people are always like <laughs> after hours. What an incredible New York movie. Chud. Yeah. <laughs> but love it. But you know, I don't know. For the record, Liquid Sky available on Blu-ray from Vinegar Syndrome. Everybody should go check it out if you have not. You Liquid Sky on Blu-ray? Why didn't I yes, just sir. I've got to buy I've, it? I've got it on the shelf across the <laughs> across the way from me. You have Liquid Sky? <laughs> yeah, yes, sir. You've seen Liquid Sky? Of course, yeah. Liquid Sky is amazing. So, what's your background, man? So you, you <laughs> so you were, so what? You're like also have a, you were a kid and you just were so enamored with movies that you watched every movie in the video store, or what? Funny enough, uh, it's kind of the opposite. I was in a tiny town. Uh, do you know California super well? I know that you spent some time in LA, but um, sure. if you've ever, uh, if you've ever driven to Vegas from LA, I yeah. grew up in Barstow. Oh, yeah, I know where that is. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so I, I grew up in Barstow. There was nothing there. There's We had a blockbuster and then a little mom and pop place. But because it's so small, they only made money on the mainstream film. So I, I only heard of like the Jurassic Parks and the shit like that. So um, all of that was normal in my house. But it took me branching out into finding friends in the music scene. I uh, used to host shows. I had bands stay at my house. Um, we, we'd be hanging out and they'd be like, man, uh, we're talking about a song they're working on. And they'd be like, this is the, the inspiration from it. They talk about some films and I'm like, I've never even heard of, like evil dead Two. They'd be like, what's, you know, what do you think of evil dead Two? I'm like, what's evil dead. And I'd go, have to go and watch it. And so because I was so enamored with the music industry, I'm our, you know, best buy in circuit city on Tuesdays, pick up new CDs. Hey, they also have movies here. I started picking those up. And it's been a well of learning since then and discovering everything that I wasn't able to to learn about when I was younger. Do you know what is driving your um, passion? Uh, trying to um, learn about other cultures, I think. I was very sheltered as a young white male Christian from uh, two parents that were not good people. And... Oh. I have, I've not been poor my entire life, but not well off. And without the ability, you know, I, I work for immigration, my, my full-time job, and I've never been out of the country. And the only way I can travel is through cinema. I, I've experienced so many other cultures because I forced myself to learn about other places. Th these are, it's traveling the world for $20 on, on some incredible film. Uh, Scorsese, you know, putting a box set together for a criterion that goes across world cinema I can't beat that $50 price tag instead of going to seven different countries. I mean, that is a really beautiful thing to hear you say. I mean, yeah, that is kind of the point of the whole form, right? Yeah. Empathy machines and all that. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And yeah, I don't know how to beat that. That's like the most beautiful <laughs> thing you could possibly say about movies. <laughs> I appreciate that. It's what I, you know, strive for. And I, I really go off of the mantra for this channel that every single movie has been someone's favorite movie. And if I'm going to live by that, I try to find appreciation in every single thing that I see. I do too. I hate when people talk shit on movies. I, you know, you hear it all the time. It's so hard to make a movie. You kind of always want to be supportive. It's amazing. Anything good ever gets made, but like I'll sit at home and like try to watch the trailers for like all the real bad ones. You know, like, <laughs> New like new release like what is yeah. what, this this looks these like those like super cheapy sci-fi and you're like just good for these guys like whoever did spend the effort to do it and like good for them exactly it's, it's exciting to watch it's just exciting it just takes so much energy to make something that you want to go maybe there's like one great shot or two good lines or a good yeah. performance or that idea was good it wasn't fully baked but they were headed somewhere and that's 
exciting. I don't know. Exactly. I, I also I like watching the bad ones too. <laughs> There's something. There's beautiful. a lot to learn from them. Yeah, it's beautiful. During COVID, I tried to do little. I tried to program little film festivals for my girlfriend and I. Nice. And and but exactly like that, I was like, we're going to Ireland this week, and I just could the commitments and my left foot and like the boxer and like all. I'm just like trying to get into that, and then I'd nice. be like, now we're doing Vim Vendors Week, and then we'd go, oh man, Alice in the City is just paper is just paper moon. Holy shit, we didn't know that. <laughs> and pair those together. But like it was just so exciting to sort of like to do exactly that to travel through movies. We did a we did a big week on Leo Leo Carox, you know, yeah, like Move sang and Lovers on the Bridge, Lovers on the Bridge, which again very hard, unstreamable. How to get how to get the box set? That's one of the best movies I think I've ever. That guy and that movie, that took our breath away because it was travel, but it was also. It was like composition and filmmaking that, you know, it, I, I just, it was that feeling of being 14 and being like, who the fuck is yes. that? Who did that? You, you kind of feel like you know a lot eventually and you, it's hard to be surprised. Yeah. Every now and again, you'll find some old thing or there's some new thing and you're like, holy shit. What Somebody says in a video, you should watch Liquid Sky, and you go watch it. You go, damn, this is incredible. And you're like, what the fuck is that? You probably won't feel that way about Chud, but if you paired Chud and After Hours, you'll be like, well, that's the same street in the same year. <laughs> well, that's just a 360 of New York in the 80s. <laughs> Todd, you have been incredibly generous with your time. I could probably talk to you about movies for the next nine hours if we yeah, had the no, ability it's to. So fun, isn't it? I love talking about movies. <laughs> well, maybe we can do it again sometime. Thanks for hanging out tonight. I'd love to. Thank you for watching The Disconnected. On the way out, make sure that you are subscribed to the channel, that you've liked the video, and that you've copied the link to be able to share with someone else that may appreciate this.